Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Kelly Williams. I'm um, part of the ECI committee for CIS. And um, we are happy to welcome everybody back to our um, monthly case conference webinar series. We had a long hi hiatus for the summer, but we're happy to get back and share some good cases. Um, we have, um, and just a reminder, abstracts are, uh, abstract submission is open for the annual meeting for next spring. Um, and they're due in mid, um, mid November. So we have two great cases to work through today. Um, and the first one is going to be coming from Nationwide Children's Hospital. Um, and the our two presenters or our main presenter is um, Dr. Redmond and Dr. Abraham is going to act as our senior um, mentor for the case. And I will be moderating. Dr. Redmond, if you'd like to start. Yes. Uh, hi. Like she said, my name is Maggie Redmond. I'm happy to be here. Um, Dr. Abraham was an enormous help for me today, so I'm hoping you enjoy this case. So um, this patient uh, was referred to us after a year of um, recurrent pneumonias. So he had had three pneumonias and two sinusitis infections in the last 11 months. Um, these infections started when he was approximately 12 and a half years old. Um, he had a complex medical history um, and in a part of that medical history, he had actually had immunoglobulins drawn at 14 months with a normal IgG, an undetectable IgA, a slightly elevated IgM, and a normal IgG. Um, and then when he had had a FES in the last year, they had identified nasal polyps on this, on this young man. Um, his medical history, he was born at term, uh, but he had significant microcephaly. Um, so his height and weight were at the 25th percentile. Head circumference was less than the third percentile. Um, he had recurrent uh, serial CT scans and progressive hydrocephalus in the few first years of his life. And he had a VP shunt placed when he was two years old and had a mild developmental delay. He was also followed closely with ENT. He did not have significant um, otitis media infections, but he had um, chronic effusions that were impairing his hearing and had tubes to improve with hearing. Um, eventually, he needed um, hearing aids when he was 13. Um, oh, excuse me. I apologize. Um, so because of his microcephaly and developmental delay um, between he saw a developmental pediatrician and uh, genetics on multiple occasions, and he had um, a workup that included a normal karyotype, um, fragile X testing, uh, microarray with fish, and uh, no variants were detected. He had specific genetic testing, like I said, for fragile X, Angelman, uh, Rett syndrome. At age six, he was diagnosed um, incidentally with Wolf Parkinson White uh, following a traumatic crush injury, and he had ablation uh, when he was a little older than 13. So um, this is a patient who was um, referred for recurrent infections um, that developed when he was about 12 uh, with a complex medical history, but normal IgG uh, when he was uh, a toddler. Uh, so what's uh, sort of on the differential that you might be thinking about when you uh, look through this chart before you see this person in the clinic? And um, if people have suggestions, you can just put them in the chat and I'm happy to read them out loud for everybody. Yeah, I mean, I'm also happy to make some up. I can uh, pretend that people have suggestions, but. Um, someone, Carl, you was asking about um, CMV as an, an infancy that could have contributed nope. to this? No, he did not have CMV. In fact, he really did not have significant infections at all. <laughs> Selective IgA, yeah. Uh, and then and some, some, someone's asking if he is still delayed. He still has a mild delay. Um, he's um, mainstreamed in school, but has um, some extra help. But he's um, certainly able to function pretty normally. Um, he's not on anticonvulsants. 
oh, everyone's still reeling from the dramatic crush injury. Yeah. So he, um, that crush injury, he had a, um, a TV cabinet fall on him. So he got really lucky there actually. All right. Well, so some of the things that I was thinking about for him was that, you know, was this sort of like a, an atypical cystic fibrosis? Um, is this common variable immune deficiency? You know, he has microcephaly. He didn't have other sort of signs of bone marrow failure, but, you know, was this Fanconi anemia? Um, deletion of 4P16 is something that I also sort of think about as having microcephaly, but like sort of a variable immune uh, phenotype. Um, so that was some of the things that I was considering um, for him. And so um, the other thing that I found out during his initial visit that was not mentioned in, that wasn't present in the sort of my chart review prior was that um, he had had just some um, waxing and waning cervical lymphadenopathy, nothing very big, um, had been monitored by his PCP and dad really noted that when he was sick, it got a little bit worse and then improved when he was treated with antibiotics. Um, so um, after I saw him, we got some sort of first line testing and uh, his IgG was pretty notably decreased at this point and his IgM pretty no notably elevated. Um, and he had unprotective titers. His CBC, he had a normal ANC, he had a normal ALC, and his lymphocyte subsets, his CD4 and CD8 counts were normal. He had an, a decreased CD19 positive uh, absolute cell count, and his NK cell counts, absolute cell count was notably elevated. Um, so with this additional testing, um, what are, what might be sort of, I mean, obviously we're going to do something about that IgG, but in what kind of next level tests do you think people think they might want to get? Um, so Carl Yu's asking if he's ever had any fevers. Um, so no, not really. He's not had any recent fevers and parents report that he's, he's only ever had fevers with like, he had strep throat once as a child. He had like a couple ear infections where he had a fever but he's certainly not having um, recurrent fevers. And uh, yep, a B cell, B cell panel is certainly something that I was interested in getting. I, I agree. Um, any other testing that uh, people think they might want? I might have missed it already. Did you have an albumin? Uh, so, um, he had a normal chemistry. Yeah. I didn't even put it up. Sorry. It was totally normal. Thanks for asking. Um, so, um, he, so I was, um, with his elevated IgM and his IgM, when he was 14 months old, his IgM was very slightly elevated, which I see all the time. and doesn't usually make me, um, that concerned, but I thought, oh, I wonder if there's something going on there. And so I got a B cell panel, but I also sent um, CD40 ligand testing because I was mainly just a little bit curious. Um, and so his uh, CD40, CD40 ligand testing was interesting. So, um, so for this uh, slide, the control is on the left and the patient is on the right. And um, the patient had normal activation of his T cells with um, CD69, but when we look, when you looked at the expression uh, of the CD40, he had um, a, about a third of his T cells um, did not express CD40 ligand, and they also did not bind to CD40. Um, and so this was something that. Um, we've, that was present both in his initial sort of workup. And then we repeated it again, uh, several months later to see if it was real. And this is actually the data from the second, the second testing. Um, and people are asking about the CD50. Yes. So, um, the CD50 was very slightly low and I was not, um, it, 
it was not my primary concern at the time. I thought it was probably um, not the most pressing issue, but I agree it is it is also abnormal. Um, so I we also got a B cell panel. So oh sorry, the CH50. You're right. Everyone caught me. I made a typo. Sorry guys. It was CH50. Um, so his total CD19 positive B cells were low. Um, and then he had a, like an absence of switched memory B cells. And then um, he also sent um, some, you know, mitogen and antigen stimulation studies, and he had decreased proliferation to Canada and to tetanus. Um, and so this was sort of the next uh, level of testing. Um, while we were getting this testing, we were prior authorizing him for genetic testing. Um, so now that we have, um, so now that we have a little bit more data, um, what other potential diagnoses would people add to the differential? So Carl suggests says, says um, that the um, the P, the PWM suggests an intrinsic B cell defect. Uh, so that is certainly possible. Um, any other uh, thoughts about what might be going on with this patient? I don't know if everyone's looking at the chat, but Dr. Abraham is uh, responding. Uh, so sh she's responding that because he had low B, ce low B cells in total, um, that it's not necessarily an indication of an intrinsic B cell defect because uh, uh, it's not that robust of a B cell mitogen. Uh, how low were his B cells? Um, let, let me go back to that slide so I don't misspeak. But yeah, so um, he had 88 cells per microliter. Uh, uh, Carl Yu's asking, did his IgG indeed drop from 600 to 60? It did. Yeah. Now, again, the 600 was when he was 14 months old and he's now 13 and a half. So it wasn't like they were particularly close in time. But yes, that was accurate. All right, well, um, we got his genetic testing back um, about, oh, so someone's saying it has to be CD40 or CD40 ligand family of deficits. Um, I certainly was suspicious of that slight, a little bit when we were waiting for his genetic testing, though, frankly, I wasn't totally sure what was going on with him. Um, and so when we got his genetic testing back, um, he was positive uh, for two uh, heterozygous pathogenic variants in NBN. So he also had some variants of uncertain significance as well. Um, and so this was a little, I mean, a little bit surprising to me given his age and uh, his lack of serious infections when he was younger. Um, so when we Think about these two variants. So the a C uh, six five seven variant is the more commonly described variant, and it's associated with a founder mutation. And we didn't know this at the time, but ultimately, um, with testing, we um, identified his mother as the person who was heterozygous for this for this variant. And the other variant um, is an a variant that has not previously been reported in clinical disease. It's classified as PM2 in the ACMG criteria, and it impacts the second BRCT domain of the Nibrum protein, which I'll bring up on the next slide. Um, and ultimately, this was um, found 
to be um, from his father. Now, um, when we initially got the genetic testing, um, we didn't know if these um, pathogenic variants were in cis or in trans, and we weren't sure if this was truly the cause of his um, of, of his um, symptoms. Um, <laughs> so um, when we look at his, when we look at the MRN complex, again, just to remind everyone, so the MRN complex is made of RAD50, MRE11, and MBS1, which um, after ATM autophosphorylates um, is part of the DNA damage response. And over on the right, you can see the fragmentation that is typical of the um, Slavic founder variant, uh, where you have this P70 Nibrin oh. fragment, which still has some, um, which still has some function, though it's severe, it's significantly reduced. Um, and if you look in the, if you look at the um, gene, that second um, BRCT uh, domain is where the uh, novel variant uh, is located. So. When we're thinking about monogenic disorders of DNA repair, you know, these are a group of um, monogenic defects where they have shared um, similarities in terms of radiation sensitivity, cancer susceptibility, immunodeficiency, neurologic involvement, and double-stranded DNA breakage. And other, um, other disorders can also affect this pathway, like um, bone marrow syndromes like Fanconi anemia, short tel telomere syndrome, but um, having the ability to look for this DNA repair pathway, which I think somebody already asked about, um, which we'll get to in a few minutes, is really critical to know if this is something that um, your patients are able to um, manage as DNA repair. Um, so the reason that specifically double-stranded DNA uh, breaks are so significant is that they have a real impact on cell survival and even a single unrepaired um, double-stranded break is significant, is sufficient to cause cell death. And there's two repairs. Um, you can have non-homologous end joining and then also homologous recombination. And uh, for a long time, the dogma was that homologous recombination was error-free because you had the undamaged chromatid as a template and that non-homologous end joining was error-prone. But um, that has recently been reevaluated, and it may be even that homologous recombination is more prone to errors. That's um, become a more active sort of source of investigation recently. And when we review the DNA damage response pathways, um, ATM plays a significant role. Um, it's estimated right now that ATM phosphorylates something like 900 proteins, though the ones that are in Red are the proteins that we look at when we're doing the DNA repair assay. Um, I see a question about um, telomere length and short stature. So um, Dr. Abraham responded that we did not check telomere length at this time. Um, and the patient, um, his height was at the 25th percentile. So he did not have short stature. He had been pretty consistently along the 25th percentile his whole life. So um, again, these are just the, the genes that make up the MRN complex. So MRE11, RAD50, and Nibrin, which is what was impacted in this patient, Nibrin. So this is his uh, DNA double-stranded break repair analysis. So um, again, the control is on the left and the patient is on the right. Um, this analysis was done in T-cells, but you would anticipate the results to be similar for all lymphocytes. So the uppermost... Um, panels are one hour after treatment with two gray radiation to the T cells. And it's measuring um, the amount of phosphorylated ATM. And you can see that the control, the blue is the irradiated T cells. So in the control, um, they have a significant increase in phosphorylated ATM compared to our patient where he, um, his peak is only slightly shifted. But in contrast, our patient at one hour had very similar amounts of um, phosphorylated, so gamma H2AX. H2AX is a histone that is involved in the uh, damage repair pathway. Um, and so 
this is a marker of the fact that his uh, that his cells were identifying this the damage and were trying to fix it. But the critical piece is um, at the bottom. So this is 24 hours after um, irradiation, and you can see that in the control, the T cells are no longer expressing a gamma H2AX because they have repaired their damage. Whereas in our patient, um, the damage remains and the repairs are still attempting and be trying to be repaired. And so he has continued um, elevated expression of gamma H2AX. Um, in the chat, I see people are asking where we sent uh, the DNA double-stranded repair analysis. And Dr. Abraham mentioned it's her lab, which a uh, big shout out to her lab, uh, really does amazing work. And this is an amazing thing that we were able to do for this, to get for this patient. Um, I would also echo that Roshani does a very quick analysis and it's wonderful and very helpful. Mm -hmm. it, it made a, we'll get to it in a few slides, but it, it was um, really integral in helping us with this patient because, um, because we had his genetic, sorry, I apologize. So because we had his genetic diagnosis, but we weren't sure whether his defects, sorry, his mutations were cis or in trans, um, if we did not have this assay, we would have potentially had to wait um, for weeks or months to get parental testing back. But this assay took four days to, um, to result. We sent it the same day that we got his genetic results. And so we were able to know within four days that it is very likely that his variants were trans and that he had a functional defect. Um, and so I'm seeing some questions about facial dysmorphism. Um, he has, he has severe microcephaly. So he has, um, so he does have some facial dysmorphism. I would say, um, like compared to photos I have seen in like texts or or, or um, like textbooks or articles about Ni uh, about Nyvigen breakage syndrome, his facial dysmorphisms were more mild, like significantly more mild. All right, so. Because now we know that this patient has um, a functional defect, um, we were able to, to definitively make a diagnosis of Nymogen breakage syndrome for this patient. Um, so this is a rare autosomal disorder. And um, as someone's asking if there's a family history of cancers. And this is actually, this was actually very interesting. So having, um, being a carrier of a heterozygous mutation in the NBN gene has a significant impact on your risk of um, breast and um, secondary sex organ cancers, but breast cancer most specifically. And actually, our patient's father had a maternal aunt who had had breast cancer and was actually positive for um, the, the C657 mutation. And so the family was convinced that he must have inherited the um, the Slavic founder de uh, variant from his father's side of the family. But his father was not the source. So his father and his um, paternal grandmother, who was the sister of the woman who had had the, de had the mutation, were negative um, for that mutation. And father actually inherited his the novel variant from his father. So um, even taking a family history, we would have ended up sort of not in the right place, which was really interesting. Um, our patient's mother was adopted and she doesn't know her background, um, but certainly knowing that she was heterozygous for this mutation um, made a big impact on her. You know, she then had, we encouraged her to reach out to her doctor and to think about screening for breast cancer for herself. Now, luckily all of our patient's siblings um, were tested and um, none of them are um, carriers of either variant. So with Nymage and breakage syndrome, patients have severe microcephaly and abnormal facies secondary to that microcephaly. They are typically small for gestational age and have a height below the third percentile. So are, are patients um, abnormal in that he was not? 50% um, of patients have associated malformations. Um, he did have a, a, a syndactyly. 
And Nibogen breakage patients are 50 times more likely to develop cancer and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma are the most common. And their life expectancy is significantly impacted and it tends to be malignancy driven. So if you look at it, patients with Nibogen breakage syndrome who do not develop malignancy, um, infection is their primary cause of death, but they tend to live a little bit older, so into their 30s and 40s. So um, immune manifestations of Nimogen breakage syndrome, typically they have absent or low IgG levels. They're typically lymphopenic. And in fact, several have been identified on newborn screens. Our patient was born prior to newborn screening with Trex being um, rolled out in Ohio. They typically have reduced number and um, of B cells in total and also switch memory B cells, which our patient had. And um, the reason that they typically have switch memory, low switch memory B cells is that you need to be able to repair double-stranded breaks in order to have um, class switching. Um, there's a relationship between NIMAGE and breakage and ataxia, telangiectasia. Um, our patient had a variant of uncertain significance, heterozygous in um, the ATM, but we didn't seriously consider that as a cause just because he was older and did not have neurodegeneration. But both NIMAGE and breakage and AT have some common features, including uh, sensitivity to radiation and some clonal chromosomal rearrangements. Um, so our patient, just a little bit after he, when he was low IgG, he got replaced. He did very well with replacement, but even after replacement, he had subsequent pneumonias um, and had a CT scan before he was diagnosed with NIMAGE and breakage syndrome um, of his lungs that showed mild bronchiectasis. Um, and so when he had his genetic diagnosis, I referred him to hemonc and infectious disease. The infectious disease was to help with the best prophylaxis regimen because he was continuing to have infections even with IgG replacement. The family was pretty resistant to make an appointment with hemonc. And so unfortunately, um, about a month after his diagnosis, he when he went to the infectious disease doctor, um, he had two week history of rapid enlargement of his lymph nodes and he had a four centimeter lymph node and a biopsy revealed early T precursor, T precursor lymphoblastic lymphoma. He was diagnosed with stage four disease. Um, he had induction chemotherapy following induction. He had septic shock secondary to pseudomonas and um, subsequently was found to have a necrotizing polymicrobial pneumonia. Um, his treatment course was complicated. He stabilized, but he did not have complete um, improvement and surgery was recommended for the necrotizing pneumonia. But because of his nutrition status, that was not pursued. It was thought that he would likely do pretty poorly with surgery recovery. So because he wasn't doing, he wasn't responding particularly well to antifungals, uh, we considered um, interferon gamma therapy. And that was based off of um, a report published by uh, Nihai Mehta uh, in the Netherlands. And uh, we followed their regimen um, where we did 100 micrograms two or three times a week um, for our patient to try to improve his HLA-DR expression. Uh, this is uh, a graph of his HLA-DR monocyte expression. So you can see at baseline, um, he was well below the healthy average, and then he responded well to, um, well, he responded clinically to therapy, even though he never made it to a level that's a, the healthy average. But you can see his response to his treatments there on the right. Um, and so the other thing to consider for an image and breakage syndrome is the role of transplant. There was a study published this year that showed that um, bone marrow transplant can have a significant benefit in survival in these patients. And they actually had a, in their report, had 14 patients who were transplanted prior to diagnosis of malignancy, and they had significantly lower cancer rates. Um, unfortunately, our patient is not currently able to be transplanted um, because he has active infection and residual um, lymphoma and a poor performance status. And so for our patient, his prognosis is really poor. Um, and so it's his delayed diagnosis likely contributed to, to where he is now. And if he had been diagnosed earlier, it's possible that we could have prevented um, the situ 
the prognosis that he is in now and his likely death. Um, so in summary, our patient had delayed diagnosis of Nymogen breakage syndrome, even though he was engaged with the healthcare system and had had genetic evaluation. And part of that is because the atypical presentation, he did not have significant infections. He had normal IgG when he was 14 months old. He didn't have notable lymphopenia. Um, and even at presentation, he had history and findings and features that could have been CVID or could have been related to hyper IgM. Though it's important to note that both patients with Nymage and Breakage Syndrome and those with AT have been um, described as having elevated IgM. So uh, in take-home summary for this patient, you know, genetic diagnosis was critical for this patient, but the DNA repair assay was really invaluable. And, and frankly, if we had done it earlier, we would have potentially um, also been able to shorten his diagnostic diagnostic delay. Um, but even after his genetic diagnosis, we were able to very rapidly um, identify that he did have a defect and that his hetero he was a compound heterozygote. Um, and so we'd certainly, this is a case is a good reminder co to consider Nymogen breakage syndrome in the differential of patients who have microcephaly and other syndromic features, even if they haven't had sort of the typical immunologic deficits. Um, so let me look at the chat. Yeah, that was a great case, Dr. Redman. I will help with the chat because there are some good questions, but I think um, okay. Tamar and Jordan um, and I all have the same question, which is really like the normal, I, you know, like we hate to miss a diagnoses when, especially when patients are engaged, but like he had normal immunoglobulins at 14 months. Why um, clearly at that age, it's not all from mom. So like, why would that be the case if we had to insinuate and Jordan's trying to insinuate that maybe it's was, maybe it was all monoclonal, but his, I mean, it could be monoclonal, but they were normal. They weren't like overly abundant either. Right. Um, yeah, they, they were, it was like 668 or something. It was totally. Yeah. Crazy. So I guess do you have any insight or guess or um, hypothesis about why, you know, we're all going to put um, NBS on our radar, but that's very atypical to have normal. And then, you know, like if we just saw the numbers we see when he's a teenager, we would all worry more. Yeah. So I, I think I have a hypothesis, though, I would be more interested in hearing Dr. Abraham's hypothesis, but mine is that um, we know that the P70 fragment of Nibrin has some residual activity, um, and we don't really know, because his other variant is novel, what sort of residual activity that variant has, but my hypothesis would be that he had he has some residual activity, and so it's possible that his... Um, sort of DNA damage repair um, problems were more slowly accumulating than someone who is sort of a classic homozygote with the, the Slavic um, founder variant. But that's just a, I mean, that's just my hypothesis. I'd be very interested to hear if, Dave, if Dr. Abraham has a different one. Roshni? <laughs> She, uh, well, I, mean, I yeah. was thinking to the for the mute button. Maggie is correct. The P seventy fragment uh, does retain some modest amount of function, and so he is likely behaving more like a hypermorph than the classic uh, NBS patient. And so that's partly why I think uh, we were so confounded by his phenotype, and it took so long to pick up and then as maggie mentioned you know the early genetic analysis he had done uh, he had done as a child or as an infant or uh, so on was very narrow in scope and so as a result of which you know they missed the bigger picture which they could have identified much earlier but they were looking for very specific defects and so did not do a broader analysis which would have revealed um, the Nipperin variant. Great, thank you for that. Um, 
Uh, I'm going to let Maggie try to, and to address any more additional things in the chat just for the sake of time. We have another great case, um, but um, yeah. Dr. Edmonds, thank I, you for that. Yeah, I think I'll just, I'll just um, do one, address one more question, and then if, if that's okay, which is um, how does the CD40 ligand expression factor in? And I think that's a really interesting question because I don't think we totally know you know, Dr. Abraham and I were talking that it's possible that having an impaired, um, you know, DNA damage repair pathway also impacts your ability, um, you know, to express CD40 ligand. Like maybe they are related in some way that we don't know about because we don't routinely check CD40 ligand expression and binding in patients who have defects along this pathway. Um, but we don't really know. Uh, I, I don't think I can really completely explain why that's happening. I, in fact, I know I cannot completely explain why that why that has been a, a continued finding for this patient. Okay, well, thank you so much for that great case. Um, and Tamar is going to moderate the next one. Great, thanks. That was such a fantastic case. Such a, I feel like we could have talked about it for a lot longer. Um, I'm Tamar Rubin, and I'm also a member of the Early Career Immunologist Committee. And I'm very pleased to present um, one of our senior pediatrics residents at the University of Manitoba, Keely Lowen, and she will be presenting a case um, of a recurrent sinopulmonary infections and ulcers in a child with developmental delay. Um, and I just want to thank uh, our senior mentor, Dr. Aksentovic, um, for um, all her help with this case. All right, take it away, Dr. Lowen. Oh, thanks, Dr. Rubin. Um, so like uh, Dr. Rubin said, we're talking about recurrent sinopulmonary infections in a child um, with ulcers and developmental delay. Um, I just wanted to mention that uh, the University of Manitoba, where I work and train, is on a Treaty 1 territory in Canada. Um, and I just encourage you all to think about the land that you're on and what it means to you. Um, just a couple of objectives. Not super important. Um, and I have no disclosures today. Um, so our case today is a 12-year-old girl. She was born at 34 weeks gestation due to preeclampsia to non-consanguineous parents of European background. She had a past medical history of mild global developmental delay, behavior concerns, and recurrent otocinal pulmonary infection since 18 months of age. She's actually received over 40 courses of oral antibiotics, as well as several courses of IV antibiotics for primarily respiratory tract infections. She also required tympanostomy tubes for effusions, uh, which were insuited nine times due to extrusion. She had a history of chronic nasal congestion and sensory neural hearing loss as well. Early in life, she had a workup for recurrent infections, including a negative sweat chloride, a normal VFSS, negative aeroallergen skin testing, um, a fraction excretion of exhaled nitric oxide, which was normal, um, and two ciliary biopsies, um, one that had some abnormalities, um, but was inconclusive, um, I think due to inflammation at the time. She had a CT scan that had no evidence of bronchiectasis, um, but did show some parenchymal scarring. She'd also had a workup for developmental delay before we saw her. Um, so she was seen by child development and found to have a de novo 6Q deletion. Um, because of known associated conditions with this deletion, she'd had a sleep study with central sleep apnea, a normal cardiology assessment, and um, because she was having headaches, there was an MRI brain pending. Um, so a presentation for today, um, she has a history of recurrent ulcers, um, first starting at age two. She would usually have one to three oral ulcers occurring every three months. Um, they would resolve spontaneously without scarring. Um, she also had a history of gingivitis and poor dentition. Then she proceeded to have recurrent fevers from the ages of six to 10 years, um, with those episodes lasting two to four days with no specific pattern. There was no associated pharyngitis, lymphadenopathy, arthritis, arthralgias, or skin rashes. And then we were re-involved after she developed recurrent genital ulcers beginning at age 12. And these also occurred every three months, lasting for about two weeks at a time. 
She had an, uh, another immune workup at that time um, with a normal CBC aside from a slightly low lymphocyte count. She had an elevated ESR on multiple occasions and elevated total complement activity, um, along with normal C3, C4, CRP, and a negative ANA. Um, continuing on with her immune workup, she had normal immunoglobulins and vaccine response, except her mom's IgG was not detected. Pre-immunization strep pneumonia titers were not available, but post-vaccine, she had a robust response. Her anti-ANA titer was positive, and her neutrophil oxidative burst index was interpreted as normal at the time. Um, this is her flow cytometry, so I'll just direct your attention to the highlighted areas um, where she had an increased proportion of transitional B cells and a decreased proportion of the CD21, CD19 positive B cells. Um, so taking all of these pieces together, I was curious what you all would have on your differential diagnosis. For this 12-year-old girl with this chromosome deletion, sinopulmonary infections, developmental delay, and recurrent ulcers. So there's someone hinting that they, they know what is located in that region. That's, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> So we're getting um, questions about if there's ever confirmation of HSV or enterovirus in the context of these ulcerations. Um, I'm not sure actually if that was done. Do you know, Keely? I actually, I, when I was looking through her history, I don't recall seeing any testing actually for HSV or enterovirus. So it's a great question. Yeah. Um, and then there's someone commenting about concern about an auto-inflammatory disorder um, and um, a guess at A20 haploinsufficiency. PFAPA is another uh, comment here. Um, and, and a question about uh, the pattern of the fevers that she was having. Yeah, so the fevers actually didn't have a specific pattern um, in terms of like time of day or relation to the ulcers. So uh, PFAPA is also a great thought. Um, We'll continue on here. One of you guys is right on the money with this one. Um, so she has um, her chromosome deletion at 6Q23.2, Q23.3 does encompass the TNFA IP3 gene, which is known to encode for A20. Um, there's a number of other genes in this region as well, like MYB, AHI1, PEC7, and IFNGR1. Um, as well as genes um, with unknown function. Those specific genes I mentioned have been associated with disease. Um, so yeah, she has haploinsufficiency of A20. Um, it's a childhood onset systemic inflammation um, with things like oral, genital, and skin ulcers, GI and ocular inflammation, symptoms actually similar to Bichette's disease, um, and can include early onset IBD. Um, there's some photos to the right hand of the slide of the eye findings, the skin and oral ulcers. Um, there's a picture from a scope for the um, IBD or GI findings and pathology. Um, some features in this condition can be associated with autoimmune phenotypes like SLE, Hashimoto thyroiditis, psoriasis. Um, and then the penetrance and disease expressivity is variable, um, and there are some modifiers as well. Um, so the protein A20 down regulates the NF kappa B pathway, um, which is highlighted. Oh, sorry, I'm clicking too fast. Um, they did have an, oh, sorry, I'm just looking at the chat. They did have the neutrophil oxidative burst, which I understand um, is similar to a DHR, um, and it was interpreted as normal. I think I, there was 95% of the cells were normal. Yeah, so at the time, um, it was felt to be normal and probably an artifactual decrease, but I wasn't actually aware of the uh, the the defect in, in, the, in the DHR. Could you expand on that a bit? Oops. 
fine. I was trying to type. I can type <laughs> my response. If Keely wants to continue, I can type out my Sure, response. great. Oh, yeah, happy to do whatever works for you guys. Um, so just was going to mention that the NF kappa B is highlighted in um, blue on this slide. So the protein A20 down regulates this pathway, therefore restricting its inflammation. Um, and that's through A20's ubiquitin editing activity on signaling molecules like RIP1, um, which prevents it from interacting with MIMO and targets RIP1 as well for degradation. Um, so insufficiency of A20 means that there would be increased signaling in the NF-kappa B pathway and therefore increasing inflammation. Uh, and so we're all familiar that NF-kappa B has an important role in proliferation of T and B cells and that A20 is expressed in a variety of immune cells like dendritic cells, B cells, T cells, and macrophages. Um, this figure just highlights T cell and B cell responses leading to NF kappa B signaling. Um, there have been findings in mice models that indicate A20 plays a crucial role in the development of functional B cells. Uh, so, loss of A20 in those B cells led to defects in genera generation, localization, or both of the mature B cell subsets. An abnormality of B cells and disc gamma globulinemia has been observed in HA20 patients um, with decreased naive B cells, elevated IgA and IgG levels, IgG4 deficiency, and positive autoantibodies. Um, there have also been findings of reduced naive CD4 T cells and T follicular helper cells. Um, so, in summary, the NF kappa B plays an important role in adaptive immunity, but overactivation of the pathway promotes autoimmunity and autoinflammation, which is the pathogenesis of HA20. Um, so it has been described in the literature among other patients as well. Um, so common immune features among the patients have been recurrent infections, um, IgG deficiencies, um, absent polysaccharide vaccine responses and various defects in the B cells and T cells. There have been about seven other cases in the literature who have large 6Q deletions like our patients who also have findings of HA20. Um, five of these patients had large contiguous deletions and one patient actually was identical to ours. Um, some of the case reports focused more on neurodevelopmental features rather than immunologic phenotype. Um, so not every patient had a reported immune workup. Four of these cases were reported to have sinopulmonary infections um, with one having infections as their presenting feature. Um, so just highlighted on this slide, some of the different cases who had recurrent infections as well as an immune workup and bolded the ones in common with our patient. Um, so there were patients who also had an elevated ESR, normal oxidative burst and lymphopenia. Um, but as you can see, there was a variety of immune effects um, similar to ones I had mentioned earlier. Among patients who've had 6Q deletions, there are some features that are more common um, compared to people who have the singular, single nucleotide variant or indels. Um, so this would be like things like abdominal pain, lymphadenopathy, recurrent infections, short stature, failure to thrive, IUGR, speech delay, and intellectual disability. And our patient actually shares many of these features. Uh, so thinking more broadly about other syndromes, so um, you are all probably familiar that patients with um, different specific syndromes or chromosomal abnormalities are known to have immune dysfunction. Um, in a review of patients who have chromosome abnormalities and recurrent infections, um, this excluded patients specifically with Down syndrome and DeGeorge. Um, many patients had recurrent ear, nose, throat infections, anti antibody deficiencies, and developmental delay. Um, and like I had mentioned, reports of patients with HA20 with chromosomal deletions were predisposed to recurrent infections specifically. Um, 
So thinking about this gene a bit further, this particular gene has come up in different areas. So in genome-wide associated studies, um, it's been associated in polygenic conditions like JIA, rheumatoid arthritis, IBD, lupus, celiac disease, among others. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, um, there it can cause a Mendelian disease, so a very rare condition, but significant effect from the gene. Um, and in the intermediate, um, there are somatic mutations linked to conditions like B-cell lymphomas, all from the same um, A20-associated diseases. Oh, sorry, my, my slides are advancing faster than I am. Um, so our take-home messages for you is that HE20 is an auto-inflammatory disorder, um, and recurrent infection may be an early or predominant feature. Um, and we recommend considering immune evaluation in patients with known chromosomal deletions and developmental delay. Um, and we advise considering revisiting previous genetic testing in patients with unexplained clinical features. Um, and I just wanted to say thanks again to my mentors, Dr. Rubin and Dr. Aksentovich, as well to Dr. Lily Lim, um, who's a rheumatologist at the University of Manitoba. Um, thanks, and I will try to catch up with everything that's going on in the chat. Great, thank you so much. And um, I'm just looking through the comments here. So there's some discussion about um, abnormal oxidative, uh, neutrophil oxidative burst by DHR. Um, and I, I'm guessing, are you um, saying, Rashini, that it's um, just abnormal um, mean fluorescent intensity rather than um, percent yeah. of cells that, ex that have yeah. an oxygen? Um, so, uh, so what I was just saying to Mara is that you know, just saying that the percent of neutrophil showing oxidative burst can be misleading because there are certain clinical contexts where the percent may be normal, but the MFI is very abnormal. And I just gave a couple of examples like complete myeloperoxidase deficiency. You know, you see a complete shift uh, after PMA stimulation, but when you compare it to healthy uh, controls, the magnitude of the fluorescence intensity or the amount of oxidative burst is significantly low. And same thing you see with the um, NADPH oxidase P40 uh, subunit. Now, with the A20 hyper insufficiency that uh, Megan Cooper had noted, if I recall correctly, um, there was a decrease in the percentage as well. But because we don't have sufficient data, we haven't looked at enough patients, and that was partly um you know what uh, megan and i were going to do to just look at what the degree of um impaired oxidative birth there is with a20 was that something uh, unique to that patient is this more of a consistent finding but just in general from a lab medicine perspective we uh, recommend every lab report out the mfi in addition to the percentage, because the MFI can be very informative. And uh, if you don't get that result, you should always ask your lab for it, because they can give it to you. Thanks, that's uh, very helpful. Um, some other comments just about how um, perhaps a HA20 is more um, precisely um, characterize not just as an auto-inflammatory disorder, but a, a disease in the spectrum of auto-inflammation, auto-immunity, immune deficiency. Um, there's also a question or comment um, And I, actually, I, from, from Kyle Williams, I'm not sure if this is uh, related to, to this um, or the previous case. Um, so maybe you could comment there, but um, um, whether or not the, the developmental delay is a result of abnormal expression of immune-related uh, proteins like complement. Thank you. 
Sorry, Tamar, were you asking about the question about complement expression by neurons? Yes. I I really don't know what to comment about that. Um, probably Kyle might be a better person to comment. He's having trouble with his audio, so um, um, perhaps just in the uh, last five minutes then, it seems like there aren't any uh, additional questions or comments right now. Um, maybe I'll just uh, um, spend the last couple of minutes talking about uh, an article from Jackie from this September. Um, so Morgan, if you don't mind putting up the slides, that would be great. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about a small study that uh, was just published this month in Jackie looking at immunogenicity of the Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine in patients with inborn errors of immunity. So um, as you all know, the initial anti-SARS-CoV-2 vaccine studies pretty much enrolled healthy volunteers. Um, um, but, you know, some spe disease specific groups that are important to us and to others like uh, patients with immune deficiency, um, we're not really included. And there's a, you know, a suspicion or a, th um, a theoretical concern that patients with inborn errors of immunity of various types may get more severe disease. And so it would be worthwhile to more aggressively offer them vaccination. But on the other hand, because of their underlying immune deficiency, they may not respond as, as well as expected to vaccines. And of course, as we all know, um, the inborn error of immunity group um, vaccine response may have implications for other populations like those patients with secondary immune deficiency for medications or otherwise. Um, we also know from studies about um, immunity to the SARS-CoV-2 virus that both neutralizing antibodies as well as cellular responses are probably important. So um, a vaccine response study should probably look at both. Um, so this um, was a single center study out of Tel Aviv looking at a small group of patients with inborn errors of immunity who um, received their COVID vaccines. And they wanted to evaluate the early humoral and cellular response to the vaccines in these in this adult patient. So um, they, the way that they did this is they collected plasmas, plasma and PBMCs two weeks after the second dose. Um, and they measured humoral response to the vaccine by looking at anti-SARS-CoV-2 spike and receptor binding domain. Um, antibodies and um, assessment of neutralizing ability by looking at inhibition of RBD ACE2 binding. And uh, for the cellular response, they looked at an Ellis spot estimate of IL2 and interferon gamma secretion in response to pool SARS CoV 2 SNM peptides. Okay, so um, this is kind of the summary of the key results. Um, they included 26 patients with a variety of diagnoses, including um, a group with XLA, so B negative humoral immune deficiency, non XLA, so B positive humoral immune deficiencies, and then a third subgroup that included patients with immune dysregulation as well as other defined genetic diagnoses. And of these 26 patients, 22 were on immune globulin replacement therapy. Um, 18 out of 26 of the patients developed a specific antibody response. 19 out of 26 showed S peptide specific T cell response. And there was only one patient in that whole group who made neither an antibody response nor a T cell response. And importantly, there seemed to be no significant adverse events um, within the group. Um, they also um, importantly included uh, a patient with, for example, STAT1 gain of function, which in theory, there might be problems with um, um, uh, uh, or theoretical concerns with giving an mRNA vaccine, and that patient didn't particularly have any adverse events. So the conclusion of the study, which is, I think, um, although a small study and limited by looking at early humoral and T cell response, not looking at outcomes like infections afterwards, was promising in that it appears that vaccinating patients, adult patients with inborn areas of immunity is safe, and most patients could develop vaccine-specific antibody response, as protein specific cellular response, or both. And I would uh, encourage you to read the paper, which was a, a nice study. Okay, so I think it's eight o'clock and, um, or eight o'clock here at least. So thanks everyone for joining and uh, hope you all have a good evening. 
Thank you for the presenters, those great cases and discussion.